Let us pray together. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth this evening and the meditations of all of our hearts together somehow be acceptable to you and strengthening to us and inspiring to the world. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, back in the day, a long time ago, back in the day when I was still new in New York, when I still got invited to lots of parties, when I used to give the occasional party, there was one party, there is one party that stands out in my mind as being the party that I probably went to. My friend, the host, was for the most part a polite southern transplant to New York, impressed most people as a nice guy, polite to his mom, nice to people on the subway, but he had another side. That other side was coaxed out sometimes by a little bourbon, I found out, often coaxed out by a certain kind of music, I found one day he gave a party to which I was invited, and at some point during the night, all the living room furniture was shoved against the walls, and Alan, the host, and our friend Valerie made their way to the center of the room. It was silent for a moment. None of us knew exactly what was happening. And then the slow strains of Proud Mary began to play. And if you know that song, you know that it is slow and deliberate for quite a long time, like three and a half minutes or something. And then, like a sudden explosion, the music begins to race, and Tina Turner's wonderful, raspy voice starts to spit out the words, and Alan and Valerie were possessed. Their bodies gyrated and moved in ways that defied human anatomy and human decency, I might add. They were rolling on the river of music, carried away by its joy, and those of us on the sidelines trying to stand still soon were catcalling and hollering, and soon enough, the whole dance floor filled up with music, and we all danced and sang together. Music carries us away like that. It carries us away like nothing else that I know of. When we open our mouths to sing, and church is one of the few places left in society where we actually do that. We open our mouths to sing, and our minds, and our throats, and our lungs, and our imaginations join together in one seamless expression that sometimes lifts us up out of our everyday world. Sometimes a song can lift us literally out of our depression. Sometimes a song can help me not to be so afraid of the dark. Do you ever sing in the dark? Sometimes a song can light the flame of faith in a time of doubt. And sometimes, every once in a while, it's as if the song is actually singing us. We're so carried away. This past week, as the murdered innocents of Newtown, Connecticut were buried, in some cases, they were buried out of churches where, no doubt, words from preachers like me, from pulpits like this one, were spoken. For the numb relatives, many of those words may not have registered their grief-stricken minds, unable to connect. But I would bet that when the congregation stood to sing, even if the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles were silent, on some level that music sunk into their souls and picked them up just a little bit and supported them 
in the well of their grief. Mary was about 14 years old when she got pregnant. You will remember that at the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel appears to her in light and glory and tells her that she will be the mother of the Lord, she answers most beautifully, most serenely. She says, here I am, the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Those words have been held up to us, the faithful, for 2,000 years as an example of how we ought to respond when God calls to us. Like Mary, we too are servants of the Lord. Like Mary, we are called to give birth to Christ in this world, quite literally. 14th century Christian mystic Meister Eckhart once said, we are all meant to be mothers of God. All of us. Indeed we are. But this story does not end with Mary's quiet and brave acquiescence to the will of God. And neither do our stories. It's one thing for Mary to accept the will of God in the presence of a glittering angel. It's one thing for us to think we have heard God's voice in this room. It is quite another thing to obey that voice out there in a dangerous and threatening and cynical world. Soon enough, the light and glory of the angel faded. But Mary was still 14 and pregnant. There she was, as Barbara Brown Taylor writes, suddenly alone and disadvantaged. She doesn't have a sonogram or a husband or an affidavit from the Holy Spirit that says, this child is really mine, so leave the poor girl alone. Maybe she was completely overwhelmed. Maybe she was terrified to talk to her parents. Maybe she decided to run away from home. Luke says, interestingly enough, that Mary went with haste to her cousin Elizabeth's house, the same Elizabeth married to Zachariah that Pastor Emily preached about last week, the same Elizabeth, future mother to John the Baptist. And maybe terrified 14-year-old Mary ran away to Elizabeth's house because she knew or hoped that Elizabeth would accept her no matter what, and there she could make a plan and clear her head. She wouldn't have to do it by herself. So maybe in Mary's mind she hoped or expected that Elizabeth would accept her, but she got far more than acceptance. She got ecstasy when she arrived. Elizabeth took one look at her pregnant cousin and cried out in the words of the rosary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But Elizabeth's greeting, I imagine that Mary was so overcome with relief and gratitude that in the spontaneity of a 14-year-old, she threw her head back and maybe she laughed and then she started to sing. And it wasn't just any old song, it was a song of the prophets, a song of Israel, a song of bravery, a song to shake the world from its slumber, a song to call the leaders of society to account, to answer. 
We read this story, we tell this story so far removed from its context, but it is its context that makes it so amazing. You see, Mary sang her song in one of the most oppressive regimes of her time. Under the conquering Roman Empire, the people were ruled locally by a despot named Herod, a puppet known for his cruelty and his greed. His lavish lifestyle was financed on the backs of the poor. The balanced budget came on the backs of the poor. Does that sound familiar? He was so brutal and so unpopular that he knew that people would party when he died, and so he imprisoned 70 elite Jewish leaders to be executed on the day of his death so that somebody in Israel would cry. That is the context in which a pregnant, 14-year-old young woman lifts her voice in song and she sang, God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones, Herod, and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry, those people who have nothing to eat because of you. God has filled them with good things and sent the rich folks away empty. And with those words, that shy, pregnant 14-year-old stepped into the shoes of a prophet of Israel, daring to speak truth to power, daring to believe the promises of this God for this world, having the guts to sing God's dangerous, edgy song, and it still is, and it always has been. When the great reformer Martin Luther translated the Bible into the vernacular, into the common German language of his day, he would not translate the Magnificat into German. He left it in Latin. Because the German princes who supported Luther's Reformation were not at all keen about the powerful being removed from their thrones. Likewise, in the 1980s, when the military juntas ruled so much of Latin America, Mary's song was actually banned in Guatemala. You could not read it, you could not sing it. Because the generals heard in those words the seeds of socialism, the redistribution of wealth and justice for the oppressed. But Guatemalan Christians gathered to sing her words because in them they heard the promise of food for everybody, dignity for all, and no more disappearing husbands and sons. What do we hear in her song? What do you hear? What I hear maybe is the promise of a world in which the NRA is toppled from its throne. And our children are not murdered in their classrooms. Or maybe you hear the promise of a more equal sharing of this country's incredible wealth. Could it be that you hear a song about a collective action and sacrifice that we most desperately need to stave the rising of the seas? As grim as all of those things are, as grim as Mary's life was, are we willing to sing God's song in the face of God? Let's not answer that question too quickly. 
because singing God's song is a real commitment. It's easier to look at the dead children and adults of Newtown and every town and assume that there is nothing we can do about it, to be lost in our fears and defeated by the darkness of it all, to retreat to our apartments and our celebrations of Christmas. But over the din of all of that celebration, God is still singing. God has never stopped singing. And if we are willing, God will sing us. It's like Alan and Valerie and Tina Turner. You just have to give yourself over to the music. You have to be willing to let that song actually dance you out of your complacency and into the streets and up to Albany and down to Washington into the halls of Congress. But James, we're just a small church with limited resources. James, half the people are away today. Yeah, so what? Mary was pregnant and 14. Mary was pregnant and 14. And Mary laughed and threw her head back and sang a new song and danced to a place she had never imagined possible. Mary gave birth to God, and so can we. 